The historic trail of Blair Athol was set up about 10 years ago. The purpose was to give visitors uh, and residents alike an opportunity to visit uh, some of the key uh, historic points in the area and do it on foot rather than having to drive. Currently we're standing here in the memorial car park at Blair Athol and the walk we're going to do today is along here into the Bridge of Tilt and then up to Kilmer Vionic Church. Now it's interesting to say but before the road was moved from, the, from here down to the current road there was a village of Kilmer Mioneg. and when this road was uh, uh, replaced by this road here um, Kilmer Vionig moved down to the Bridge of Tilt a place called Ballantool and so that's, that's how that settlement moved to here in the same way as the people living up here moved down to here. That's as a result of the change in the road system. Now we're going to go there and then we're going to go up along, along the um, River Tilt, uh, along here, and then uh, uh, back through to uh, St Bride's Church and then back down to, into the village again. Now the earliest uh, um, sign of habitation, in the, of human occupation in this area was when a skeleton was uh, a fictitious man was discovered locally in 1986 and this was carbon dated to the period between 410 and 590 AD which is the classic Pictish period and the word just as a matter of interest Pict comes from the word Picti meaning painted one. Now that's way back uh, in time if we move forward in time the first reference of a date uh, uh, the earliest reference of a date in this area is to Blair Castle which was be building began in 1269 that's the earliest date uh, and that was the centre of uh, a little village around the, uh, the castle linked up to Old Blair. Now the story of the area really is linked to the communications that took place. Back in the, in the 1700s the Great North Road went up through Kilmer Vionig over the old bridge of Tilt which was the only crossing point of the river Tilt and then north from there and there was the Caledonian coach service would run from Inverness to from Perth to Inverness it took three days to do 120 miles uh, somehow or other they managed to get that down to two days but that was the old road yes. then in 1822 the new road was opened uh, at a crossing point here on the uh, on the river tilt which we can look at very shortly and that uh, that meant that this road became redundant and the old Blair uh, began to close down because everybody began to move down into the new area uh, alongside the the what is now the main road from uh, Pit Lockery to the House of Brewer. Subsequently in the late 1970s the A9 was opened and it was considered that this might make impact in a negative way on the village but in actual fact it improved the quality of life in the village took away all the heavy uh, duty uh, traffic and, and uh, the village now is a very very pleasant place to live. Now the River Tilt is a very key uh, bisector of the area with the uh, Athol estate on one side and the Lude estate on the other side. Uh, the Athol estate uh, comprises about 145,000 acres at, at, at the present time. And that, the Athol, uh, Blair Castle is one of the very important uh, attractions of this, particular, of this area. But as we will see as we walk around the historic trail, there are many other points of interest that will uh, appeal to the visitor. Can I ask you a question? You may. Okay, Wade's, Wade's Road, where was it? Right, General Wade's Road this was the Great North Road was built by General Wade in the 19 uh, sorry in the 1700s uh, on instructions of George uh, of George the first uh, and he built about 250 miles of military roads and bridges uh, and there are various bridges in the area of which the one at Tummel Bridge is probably one of the best examples uh, that we will see when we go to Kilmer Vionic Church that there is an, a, an area you can see where the road used to run and if you go to the, uh, the information centre at Killy Cranky and into the corner of the car park there is the remains of the road surface you can see there. Now we've talked about the roads running through Blair Athol 
One of the things that also uh, revolutionized the area was the introduction of the railway line. Now, in 1845, they considered the possibility of introducing a railway line north to Inverness, but it was considered to be impractical because steam trains uh, were not considered able to go up over the Dromocta Pass. However, the situation was resolved, and in 1863, the railway line was opened in September 1863, and in, curiously enough, Queen Victoria travelled up by train six weeks after the opening to stay at, the, at Blair Castle. She had subsequently, had previously stayed at Blair Castle in 1844, and that's something we shall cover uh, later on in the walk. The original parish church for the area was at St Bride's Church at Old Blair. Once this road was opened, this church was built. It was designed by a, a Edinburgh architect called Archibald Elliot in 1825. Queen Victoria visited the area on a, two or three occasions. Uh, in 1844 she came and stayed at Blair Castle and attended a church service here and the service was conducted by the minister, the Reverend Dr Alexander Irvin and he was given very strict instructions to make sure that the service was no longer, the sermon was no longer than 25 minutes and I think what the Queen wanted the Queen got. <laughs> As you approach Blair Athol from the either end of the village, you will see a sign with a Scotsman in full dress, Donald McBeath, a local man who was a hero in the Crimean War where he was a sharpshooter. He returned to his home base. He became the head keeper on the Athol Estates and died in 1911 and is buried here in the parish church. historic tour is the Country Life Museum. Now first of all I highlight the fact the Country Life Museum provides a very detailed insight into life in the area going back over a number of, uh, of centuries really. Um, they have new displays every year. It's a very vibrant operation. Originally built in 1833 as the local school. Built in 1833 in 1873, there were 135 students here. So you get the feeling that this was a busy community with 135 students. But uh, then over in the, what is now the, uh, the visitor's center, that used to be the uh, cafe or the cafeteria for the, um, for the students. You'll notice that over the door, there is a white horse uh, that was originally over the entranceway to the uh, uh, Athol Arms Hotel, which was a stop on the coaching route from Inverness, from Perth to Inverness. And it was over the door there uh, and uh, subsequently was moved to the museum as a point of historic interest. Here we are on the bridge across the River Tilt, which was built in 1822. Uh, it's quite a narrow bridge and uh, for anybody who's on a bicycle, for example, traffic coming the other way can be quite uh, imposing. Uh, as a matter of interest, the uh, cantilevered walkway footbridge was installed around 1960 and of course that made it much easier for people walking across the bridge because the amount of traffic uh, was going through Blair Athol, particularly before the A9 was built, made this quite a busy place and therefore you had to move on your foot, on foot or on bicycle with tremendous care. Matter of interest, those interested in, 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 in bridge construction, this, the bridge comprises three segmental arches and 
together with triangular cutwaters. The purpose of the cutwaters is to divide the flow of water approaching the bridge in order to uh, minimise or eliminate the possibility of erosion of the bridge. When this road was opened in 1862, plans were put in place to build the Bridge of Tilt Hotel, which you see here. At the same time, the Athol Arms Hotel was built down in the other side of the, of the, of the river. You can see that the hotel is now undergoing a major refurbishment, and this is what it used to look like when it was originally built. Okay, here we are walking past the old Bridge of Tilt Hotel. In the distance, we can see the site of St. Andrew's Church, which was started built in, to be built in 1855 and was subsequently taken down, as we'll learn when we reach the site of that church. Yeah, this is where the road runs down here. You can see people here uh, in their old skirts and uh, old fashions and the houses along here, which are pretty much the same as they are. Right, we've talked about two churches, St Bride's Church at Old Blair and the church of uh, the parish church just along the road here. Now, the co first construction of the first free church of Scotland started in 1843 and it took place on a, a site on Kings Island, uh, just on, uh, south of the village here, where it was subject to flooding. And so an arrangement was made, made to build a church here. And this is where they built St Andrew's Church um, in 1855. The construction started in 1855. And then the Free Church of Scotland uh, uh, eventually uh, uh, amalgamated with the established Church of Scotland. Um, so that meant we had a parish church here and a parish church down the road. So it was decided after that church down the road was renovated in 1950, um, this was used as the parish church and then subsequently it was considered to be redundant. So in 18, 1968, I'm getting my dates wrong, <laughs> in 1968 the main part of the church was to, uh, demolished and in 1971 the tower was demolished. So that's the third church in the area that we talked about. This one no longer exists but there is the remains of the that's vestry wall is behind that, head, that uh, fence. And what is this spot now? This spot is now what they call a resting park, where you can sit quietly and enjoy uh, the fresh air. And then at Christmas time, it's illuminated with the Blair Athol Christmas decorations. The next point on the historic tour is Kilmer Vioni Church, which if we just move a little bit to the side here, you can see uh, it's an Episcopalian church over there. We're going to walk up the road here to the Kilmer Vioni uh, Episcopal Church. I'd just like to point out that originally before this road here was built there was a settlement there with houses and and uh, shops and that sort of thing and then when this road came this the Kilmer Violi settlement was moved across here to what they call Ballintool but this is now actually Bridge of Tilt. Okay. Right. A point about the stream, I don't know whether this is hearsay or whether it is true, but a Mr. Gentleman called Mr. John uh, Common of Badenoch came down and started to build Blair Castle in 1269. He is reputed to have used the water from this stream to make beer. And when he was thrown out of Blair Castle, when the occupants, the full occupants came back from the Crusades in the Middle East, John Common of Badenoch was uh, thrown out, but apparently he still used the water from the stream to uh, make brew his beer. Now, whether or not that's hearsay, I don't know, but I did hear it from a reliable source. <laughs> the, the course of the military road built by General Wade ran up through this section here past that gate and came from this area of pit lockery cut across this ground and went due north from there um, here we are now at the uh, uh, episcopalian church the first reference to this church was 
in uh, 1275 in official records. Uh, it was rebuilt by the Robertson family of Lude in 1591. It went through various stages, but the worst stage of all was it was burnt down in 1746 after the Battle of Culloden because of the local association with the Jacobites. So it was burnt down and then, for, and then it was um, rebuilt in 1794 and then restored again in 1898 and re-dedicated uh, on the 28th of July on that particular year. And it is now a regular place of worship for the Episcopalian Church. If you go inside, you will see funeral hatchments, which are diamond-shaped plaques uh, depicting the shields and arms of the Robertson family, who used to be the landowners here. So that is the Episcopalian Church. Uh, it's one of two churches which are in operation in the local area. Where are we going from now? Right, now, from the Episcopalian Church, we're going to walk back down to the road, turn right, and then we're going to follow the path along the River Tilt. There are two or three points of historic interest alongside the River Tilt, which are very well worthwhile visiting. So, Peter, all around here would have been the village. Yeah. And it was moved down to the bottom. It was moved down, yeah. The next thing is the wishing well, which is... Um, uh, superstition has it that if you chuck a, a white stone into the wishing well uh, and make a wish that should come true. I've got some white stones with me, so we're going to put it to the test. We are at the wishing well on the historic trail. Uh, not a great deal is known about that. There is a superstition that if you take a white, uh, a white stone and you toss it into the, uh, the well and make a wish, hopefully it'll come true. Now, there has been a tenuous association between the wishing well and what they, the ceremony of Beltane. Now, I don't know whether this is true, but it's been suggested to me that it may have been involved in the Gaelic May Day Festival, commonly held on May the 1st every year, halfway between spring and equinox and the summer solstice. It is widely observed through Ireland, Scotland and the Isle of Man. And holy wells were often visited at Beltane and other Gaelic festivals, and visitors to the holy wells would pray for health and leave offerings such as coins and clouties. The first water drawn from a well on Beltane was seen as being especially potent, as was the Beltane morning dew. At dawn on Beltane, maidens would roll in the dew or wash their faces with it, the theory being that this would uh, 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 increase their attractiveness and sexiness, their sexual attractiveness. <laughs> Whether or not this is true, I don't know, but it might be worth a try. Might be worth asking one or two maidens yeah. in Blair Alpha. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that's the wishing well, which is on part of the walk. And our next move is now the Witch's Rock. Here we are at the Witch's Rock, which is a very large rock overlooking the River Tilt. Now, back in the 15, 16 and 1700s, witchcraft was looked upon uh, in a very unfavourable way. The Witchcraft Act of 1563 uh, considered it to be unlawful, unwanted, and there were a series of five trials took place over the following years in which at least 1,500 women, mostly women, were convicted of being witches and subsequently uh, executed. 1,500 where? In Scotland or, or Blair Athol? No, not in Blair Athol. <laughs> no, not in Blair <laughs> No, over the period of, of the trials throughout the, the UK. Locally, the Witches Rock, people who were considered to be or thought to be a witch were put on the top of the rock and pushed off into the pool. Now, if they could swim, they were deemed to be a witch. If they couldn't swim, then they had a bit of a sorry ending. Those who did swim were considered to be a witch and were subsequently dispatched in another way. Uh, one of them rec uh, mentioned in records is strangulation followed by burning. 
This is not a good way to go. Just to add that the Witchcraft Act, which was uh, in, uh, implemented in 1563, was actually repealed in 1736. So um, from then on, who knows what happens to the witches? Terrible. Anyway, here we are at the Witches Rock, and I have seen people climbing up on that and jumping into the pool below at all occasions during the last few years. <laughs> yeah. But I don't think any of them were witches. <laughs> Down here. here we are at the grotto uh, overlooking uh, the uh, River Tilt. Uh, in 1844, when Queen Victoria came on holiday here, she went to the grotto to overlook the river to watch the salmon moving up and down the stream. Now, opposite on this side of the, uh, of the, of the river, there was a waterfall called the York Cascade, which took the water from the mill race which fed the corn, lint and sawmills in old Bridge of Tilt and the water came down and cascaded down into the river at the York Cascade. Now if we move along a little bit further we can see where the, that particular mill race has been diverted. The River Tilt and its tributary the River Gary which flows into the Tay are uh, classic spawning rivers for the uh, Atlantic salmon. Uh, the main run for the Atlantic salmon is from July, August, September, October, that sort of period when the salmon come up here from the sea and find their way back to almost exactly the point in the river where they were born. They have this incredible homing instinct which is brought about by uh, navigating from the stars and from the um, magnetic field of the, of the earth. They can navigate their way back here almost exactly to the spot that they, they, that they originated. They are fish which swim quite close to the surface, so they can then uh, uh, navigate from the stars. The old mill race which went uh, over the York Cascade a little bit earlier opposite the grotto has been redirected and it right, runs right down through this garden here. That's the old mill race and uh, eventually finds its way again into the, um, uh, the River Tilt, but it would not be quite as a cascade would imply. And where was the mill? The mill, the mills were the lint, the mills and the sawmills were all here in old Bridge of Tilt when this was a more of a settlement. These houses are all new round here but there used to be a settlement here and further up Monee, up to Monee. There was, uh, 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 there still are houses there but they're not as abundant as they used, as they used to be. This is the site of the old Black Bridge which was mentioned in Timothy Pont's map of Blair Athol, which dates from 1583. It was the only river crossing uh, of the River Tilt. Uh, when the Great North Road came up through here, General Wade's road, road, road came up through here. The road has been uh, up, consider, considerably updated since then, as you would expect, and the road is in, has been improved. But this is a, a significant spot as being the only bridge over the Tilt until 1822, when the new road was opened. Our next stop on the, on the historic tour, we're going to walk just up to the brow of the hill there and then cut up through the woods to what we call the Balvini Pillar or the Hanging Tower, which has sinister overtones. This is the road up to the, the last few steps of a man condemned to die would be walking up here to the Balvili Pillar. Okay, here we are at the Balvili Pillar, which occupies a high spot overlooking the, uh, the Athol Estate. Uh, it was erected in 1755 by the second Duke of Athol to uh, mark the spot where public executions took place. Now, back in those days, the Earls of Athol had uh, jurisdiction over all legal matters apart from treason. And so they could meet out whatever punishment they, they liked. Anyway, they lost that in sometime in the early 1700s. But the last person to be hung here was a gentleman by the name of Mr. John Stewart from Glen Tilt. And he killed Shorry of Glen Tilt and Mackintosh of Glen Taff. 
Now I could go into the full details, but apparently he shot, he got, uh, uh, killed Shory of Glentilt, was put in prison for that. When he came out, he discovered that Mackintosh had been laughing about it and saying it was a jolly good thing that John Stewart was put in jail. So John Stewart took out his vengeance on um, uh, Mackintosh and killed him. And he was tracked down to a place up in the north of Scotland and brought back and summarily executed here as the last man to die at the Balvini Pillar or Hanging Tower, as the other word is. So that was 1755, erected by the second Duke of Athol. We can say that your man who was to be hung would have a very, very good view of the area as he d departed this life, including in the far distance, the mountain Shehalian. The mountain Shehalian there. Uh, uh, now, the interesting thing about Shehalian, if I could just interject something, it was used by the Astronomer Royal in uh, a period in the late 1700s to measure the weight of the Earth. He put four uh, observation posts round the, uh, uh, the same height above sea level round the, the mountain. He measured the gravitational pull of the plumb line and from that he was able to, uh, to measure the weight of the Earth. Don't ask me how that worked. However, the interesting thing is, as a result of that, the whole idea of contour lines was developed because he had the, the observation posts at a set level above sea level. And then as a result of that, he could see the fact that the, the way that contour lines would give uh, uh, um, an illustration of height uh, on maps. Fascinating. The towers in front of us, they are, that's Blair Castle in front of us there. And then below Blair Castle is a Hercules garden, which is, uh, was restored by the, the 10th Duke of Athol and his mother uh, using uh, uh, funds provided by the government to restore it to its original form. And it is a spectacular garden. If you have an opportunity to visit, well worth it. Our next stop after the Hanging Tower is to go back down onto this road that you can see below. That w winds round to Old Blair where there are two or three points of interest, particularly St. Bride's Kirk, which is there. The ruins of St. Bride's Kirk, I should add. We certainly live in a spectacular area, don't we? Oh, yeah. Minigag Street. There's a little bit to say about yeah. See which sign there. It says... The sign here for Minibag Street marks the start of the old Minigag Pass, the main route through the Grampians from Athol to Badenoch, which is up north. The route was used by drovers and continued to be used uh, uh, until about 1900 by those intent on avoiding paying tolls on the parliamentary road. So they were avoiding uh, tolls by going through the Minigag Pass. Right, this is Old Blair Lodge, uh, originally a coaching inn on the Great North Road, which came up through here. In 1736, the, India, the, the innkeeper extended the facilities to include 17 rooms and stabling for 26 horses. And I mentioned earlier that um, it took three days to travel from Perth to Inverness. Uh, this was subsequently cut down to two days. Um, uh, the Royal Mail service from Perth to Inverness operated on the new road that we pointed out from uh, July 1683 and subsequently this became uh, um, un un devalued um, and um, then, then of course the railway came in 1863 and uh, that further devalued the coach run from, Inver from Perth to Inverness. Dorothy and William Wordsworth were noted visitors to the inn at Old Blair. Here we are now at St Bride's Church uh, at Old Blair. Um, it was originally the parish church and it was mentioned uh, first mentioned in official documentation in, seven, in 1275. So it goes back quite a long time. Um, it's named after St Bridget, the famous abbess of Kildare. Um, one of the key things about it is in, in its vault is the resting place 
of uh, Bonnie Dundee, uh, who was the leader of the, Jacob uh, the Jacobite forces at the Battle of Killiecrankie, July 1689. He was killed in the last uh, moments of battle. I was going to say the last hour of battle, but indeed the battle only lasted about 30 minutes. But he was killed in the dying moments of the Battle of Killiecrankie, and that is where he's, he's laid to rest. Interestingly enough, a piece of his armour is on display in Blair Castle. The church was repaired in 1824, but only remained in use until 1825, at which point the new parish church, which we looked at earlier, that took over as the main centre of worship in the area. And subsequently, this fell into a state of disrepair. There's something, I think, rather majestic about the building. Despite the fact it's not in very good shape, it is rather, rather imposing. Very close to St Bride's Church is the uh, burial ground of many of the Dukes of Athol, which is right here before you. George Ian Murray, 10th Duke of Athol, 31 to 96. Well, here we are at Blair Castle now. This is a five-star tourist attraction. The building of, uh, of, uh, started in uh, 1269. Uh, with uh, Mr. John Common from Badenoch came down and took over the land while the owners were on the Crusades and he started the building and then subsequently he was ousted but he did leave the largest tallest part of the castle which is Common's Tower uh, that's the flag where the flagpole is um, the castle has been added to and adapted over the years originally it was a uh, typical castle with them um, but it's all been whitewashed now and turned into more of a Georgian mansion. That's the style, a Georgian mansion in the 1700s. It is a house which is extremely well worth visiting, full of artifacts and history uh, going back uh, over many, many centuries. Um, no one actually lives in the castle, but the, uh, the wing uh, to the left here is occupied by, by um, a family. Um, Obviously it's closed at the moment, but uh, uh, a visit to the Blair Castle and then subsequently, if I can get you to wheel around, you can go along over there and through a gate that takes you to the Hercules Gardens, which is these spectacular gardens, wall gardens, which were laid out by the initiative of the 10th Duke of Athol and his, and his mother. We're just leaving Blair Castle, we're going to walk down the avenue here, the avenue here which is bordered on either side by lime trees. And I think there were 97 lime trees uh, going up and down uh, on both sides. And then when we reach the end, we're going to go and visit the uh, Athol Arms Hotel, the railway station, and the bridge over the River Gary. This is the old bank house, the first, um, uh, which is the former Union Bank building with its tea caddy roof line. That's how it's described the tea caddy roof line designed in 1923 by George Arthur and Sons. The Bank of Scotland finally closed here in 2004 and it is now a private residence. The hall here, this is the village hall, it was uh, designed by Mr J McIntyre and built in 1906 and 1907 by subscription as a drill hall for the Scottish horse, whose emblem can be seen over the door there. The regiment was formed by the Marquis of Tullybarden, who is heir to the Duke of Athol, um, and is named as the Tullybarden Drill Hall. The hall now has many uses and is the practice venue for the Pitlockery and Blair Athol Pipe Band. And there are all lots of activities go on there throughout the year when the conditions are normal. Clearly they're not at the moment. In the process of moving the main residences from Old Blair down to what one might call New Blair, uh, a further expansion started in the 1850s when plans for cottages in Blair Athol were drawn up. These consisted of a row of substantial houses that you can see there, including shops, a post office and a police station. If you go round the back of these buildings, there is a smithy which operated for some time but which is no longer working.
when the new road opened, on the other side of the river at Bridge of Tilt, permission was granted to build a hotel there. And whoever it was was building the hotel suggested to the Duke of Athol that he needn't bother to build a hotel on this side of the village. But the, uh, the, the, the Duke of Athol ignored that advice and that was the fourth Duke of Athol and on the 23rd of June 1830 the, new, the foundation stone for the new inn was laid and it was completed in 1832. Since then in 1854 considerable additions were made with further stabling and coach houses because of course this was a stop on the coach route between Perth and Inverness. And so further around the back they put more stable and that white horse that you, that you now see at the museum was over the archway there. Uh, these additions were finished in 1877 when a further building to the rear formed a rectangle and completed the courtyard round there. It is now a very uh, uh, popular hotel in the area, uh, not only for travellers but for locals, um, and with a very fine baronial style dining room in there worth a visit. Here we are opposite the Athol Arms Hotel is the War Memorial which was opened, in, unveiled in, on the 18th of May 1924 and it commemorates the fallen of World War I and World War II of the parish of Blair Athol and it weighs 20 tonnes and the stone was quarried at Cragner Burns in Dunkeld and every year uh, uh, on um, Remembrance Day there is a celebration here with the uh, Athol Highlanders Pike Band uh, taking part and leading the celebration. standing on the site of what was a bowling green it's north of, of um, the Athol Arms Hotel and the area is now occupied by a flower shop and a homeware shop. The bowling green was sold in 1929 by the Duke of Athol together with the Athol Arms Hotel to the occupier D and D MacDonald. You can see now that there's no semblance of a bowling green here but it's nice to think at one time that was a green sward. Proposals for building a railway line between Perth and Inverness were first mooted in 1845, but it was considered unlikely that steam trains would be able to negotiate the Dromocta Pass, and so it was overlooked. However, the situation improved, I suppose trains became more powerful. The Highland R Railway from Dunkeld to Pitlochry was opened on the 1st of June 1863, and the extension from Pitlochry to Blair Athol uh, took place on uh, the 9th of September 18 1863. And as I mentioned earlier, Queen Victoria came up six weeks later on the train. Uh, permission to build a station here was granted by the Duke of Athol on the condition that the trains were made to stop for um, passengers. And as it's busiest, you might be surprised to hear that 70 people were employed here. One of the things that was important about the station was the two banking engines that were on hand to help push the trains up over the Dromocta Pass. That's once the line was extended to Inverness, four trains were, went up and down uh, each day from Perth completing the journey in six hours, a six hour train ride, ride from Perth to Inverness. In 1877, sleeper carriages were added 
From 1922, the Highland Railway became part of LMS, London, Midland, Scotland. Now it's the line that is run now by LNER. LNER. Uh, it, it was in 1966 that the importance of the station was significantly downgraded. Uh, now there are no people employed apart from the man in the signal box. Okay. The signal box man controls the level crossing there and uh, uh, um, the, sig the signal box in Pit Lockery, which was a, a, a key place, that's been closed. But the signal box here continues to operate. Here we are at the famous Blair Athol water mill. It was first recorded as being here in a map by Timothy Pont in 1600. It had a roof of straw thatch and turf, and it was known as Catherine's Mill after the uh, Lady Catherine, who became the second Duchess of Athol in 1703. The mill was pulled down and rebuilt in 1840, and it stopped working in 1929, but it has been refurbished and reopened over the last, what, 25 years, and is now a very uh, popular uh, spot for homemade bread, snacks, drinks and tours of the mill. But it is a landmark in the village and very heavily noted for its homemade bread and rolls and cakes. I'm standing in the water mill car park and I'm looking across to where you see those houses there. In 1871 a gas works was built there and this supplied gas uh, lighting to Blair Castle and subsequently to the parish church and to the school. And it may interest you to know that the cost of installation of the lighting in the school was 21 pounds and 12 oh, shillings. What was 21 pounds? That was back in around 18, the 18, early 1870s. Here we are, a view from the top of Tullock Hill, looking down on Blair Athol. Now this is an old picture, but it must be uh, later than uh, 1863 because it does show the railway station which was built in, the Rhine was opened in 1863. It also shows Blair Castle here. It also shows the water mill. And this is the site of the gas works that supplied Blair Castle and the village school and the parish church. And then down here is the Gary side cottages, which we looked at, and then the bridge over the uh, River Gary. So that's an historic photograph uh, of the area, which puts everything into perspective. The bridge has particular significance. It was built by Joseph Mitchell, who was a son of Thomas Telford's deputy engineer. So he knew what he was up to. And this was built, obviously, at the time that the railway line was opened up through to Inverness. And it was built between 19, 1861 and 1862. It has two castellated turrets at each end with arches through which the trains pass. The two ends are connected by what you can see, lattice trusses. The bridge is best viewed from the road behind the watermill, which is really where we are now. Uh, this bridge, uh, the Mitchell's first bridge, crosses the River Gary at Struan. So if you go north from here, there is a bridge over the River Gary at Struan. And also his third is the viaduct at Killy Cranky, which in itself is an engineering spectacle the, the, the uh, viaduct of Killy Cranky where you can walk down and go below and walk alongside the viaduct. So this bridge, particularly the design, is I'm reluctant to say unique, but it's certainly very special. This is the one of three ferry crossings on the River Gary. It's located at the end of Ferry Road in Blair Athol and it was used uh, by farmers to bring their corn to the local mill which we've just been to see. There was once a ford at the same spot and it was used by Queen Victoria to go from this side across to that side of the river on horseback. There's no ferry here now, and I can't think when the last one ran, but clearly it's not been for many, many, many decades.
but we're now walking along towards the old bridge across the River Gary. Gary side cottages and they were built in 1856 about the same time as the cottages we pointed out in the middle of the village so there was a fervent uh, activity of building to bring people down from Old Blair into New Blair and these are the Gary side cottages. Footbridge over the River Gary which is just downstream from the ferry which we've just looked at okay the this bridge was built in the in 1860 and it replaced a three arched stone bridge which was built here in 1737 and less not less than six months later it was washed away by the severe flood the remains of the buttress can be seen and once again the river gary is part of the river network where salmon come up stream to, to spawn. You, know, you can see down there the water coming in on the left that's the river tilt that's where they're joining onto the river Gary and the pool just below that is called the junction pool for fishing for fishing for salmon. There are a number of pools all the way down to Killycranky which are suitable for fishing maybe five or six and uh, this is popular through the fishing season uh, which starts basically in on this river from May through to October. May I add, in addition to the historic sites that you can visit on the historic trail, one of the things we're very greatly blessed with in this area is the, the spectacular scenery from almost every angle that you stand in the Blair Athol area. And if you just have to look around now, even in the, uh, before the colours of the, of the trees have started to come through, you can tell that this is a place of spectacular beauty. Here we are back in the Memorial Park in Blair Athol. We've done the walk round the historic trail. We hope that we've whetted your appetite for coming to see some of the 31 points on the tour. And um, just like to add that uh, the historic trail is an initiative of the Blair Russell Area Tourism Association, who've done, uh, whose um, commitment is to bring people to the area to enjoy not only the history, but the walking, the cycling, the golf, and the fishing, not, and, and of course the scenery.